This episode of Heavy Cardboard is brought to you from the great folks over at Gamesurplus.com, bringing the world of board games to you. Now, on to the show. Heavy Cardboard, episode 107, the 2017 Golden Elephant Award finalist. Coming to you from the Miami Zoo, welcome to Heavy Cardboard, where we talk medium and heavy strategy board games, war games, 18xx, and other related topics in the board gaming hobby. We're your hosts, I'm Edward. And I'm Amanda. The Miami Zoo... 16 feet tall, 7 foot wide, 2,700 pounds and change. Golden mosaic statue to bring attention to the plight of the elephants everywhere. Seemed perfectly thematic. That's perfect. Right? Yes. So, yeah, the Miami Zoo. I thought it I thought it fit. I it thought does. I thought it fit really well, That's actually. actually amazing. So, yes. So, big shout out to Matt Kelly, who helped me come up with this, because I was stumped on where to come from, because, <laughs> well... You got 107 episodes you can go listen to. <laughs> a little bit of like background on what's going on behind the scenes. Um, right now we're working. The sausage making. Oh my goodness. Right now we're working with some of our small council with getting our website moved over from Squarespace. Because the biggest issue right now that we have with Squarespace is the fact that they have a cap on the number of episodes for a podcast that can be on an RSS feed. Which makes no sense because it's an artificial cap. I don't I know. know why they have it set at 100, don't which know. really is unfortunate if you have more than 100 releases. Correct. We have, so I mean, we obviously have more than 100 episodes since it's episode 107. Plus a number of pod blasts and yeah. daily diaries. Tons and, of yeah, stuff. First yeah. looks. There's all kinds of stuff that Dare people... Dare I say, a plethora? Jefe. So that's the one of the main reasons why we're moving off of that platform and we're working with our small council advisors to get that moved over to a better platform to where there will not be an artificial cap and people will be able to listen from episode one if they want to from their app instead is, of having to track down episode one. Yeah, it's frustrating for us as much, as well as, trust yeah. me, we hear about it every week from yeah. y'all. We're trying to work on it as fast as possible. The good news is it seems like it's going to be a seamless process as far as y'all aren't going to have to unsubscribe resubscribe right. stuff like that. Right. You shouldn't even notice other right. than all the episodes will show up in your podcast app Yeah, instead. that's my only fear when we switch over you guys might get like, all of those <laughs> and yeah, hopefully not, but we'll see how it works. So just heads up that that is in the process. Yes. We saw your spirit animal over the weekend. We did. Uh Watsky. Uh for those that don't know, Watsky is a uh, rapper, white boy rapper from San Francisco. And I have been a big fan of his music for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a tour. And this was the third stop on his tour. It was at the Ogden Theater here in Denver. Mm -hmm. It was 36 degrees. We were waiting outside well over an hour, waiting for the doors to open. Yep. Ended up with, I, I would say great seats, but it was the second standing room only concert that we've been to mm. in over a decade. Yeah. Because of my back, I don't deal well with standing room only type stuff. Yeah. Didn't we may, bother me at all. We may go to concerts that you wind up standing the whole time, but this was... At least have the option to sit. Exactly. Not, not so much here, but nope. it, absolutely amazing show. It was. Adam Vita, or A1, is kind of a... I think of these... Yes, they're rappers, but they're also poets, he, I feel like. He opened with a with a poem. Like, he was... That was, that was poetry. Yeah, that was really awesome to see. Yeah. So, big shout out to Adam Vita, because you mm -hmm. know he's listening, obviously. obviously. And then uh, Watsky, he put on a two and a half hour set. He opened with my theme song. So, a little background on this. And this, this, is, this is pretty cool, because... Well... I owe a big thanks to a friend of mine. I think I've told this story before. You have I, asked the elephant. Yeah, I don't think it's been in this forum. I don't think so. So uh, uh, last year at BGG Con, so two years ago at BGG Con, we had a, a bit of a informal meeting between myself, uh, 
Jim from Punching Cardboard, uh, Brandon and Josh from Brawling Brothers, the fellas from Low Player Count, Travis and Sean and everybody. And we just kind of were kind of a, a bouncing ideas off of each other as well as just, I mean, we're all a group of friends and, you know, hey, is this, you know, do we want to team up for something or whatever. We were going around the room. And before we started, Brandon had the idea of, hey, why don't we talk about what our goals are for our shows? And went around the room, got to me, and I was like, well, it's no secret that eventually I would love to be able to run the podcast full time. Now, keep in mind, this is before we had a YouTube channel element to the show as well. And Brandon looks at me and says, hold on. Everybody in this room needs to realize that's unlikely to ever happen. Just not going to happen. And I'll be honest, I can't tell you a single other thing that happened in that meeting. Nope, me either. But from that day forward, all I heard in my head was never going to happen. My dad, when I told him that I went to the Marine Corps recruiter uh, when I was 17 and said I was considering joining the Marine Corps, he was like, Marine Corps, (laughs) you'd never make it. Now a very proud Marine. (laughs) So... The reason I tell this story isn't isn't a dog of my friend. Brandon and I are really, really yes, good friends. Yes. And I he knows about this. I've told him about this, actually, that I remembered this. And every day I heard that in my head and I used it as motivation to, you know what? It's kind of like uh, there, there's a guy by the name of Jocko, J-O-C-K-O, out there that, that a couple of friends, Brad and, and Bev, turned me on to. He's a motivational speaker. He's a uh, former Navy SEAL, this and that. And, you know, you can find his stuff on YouTube, whatever. He has this thing that this kind of like, I don't know, you call it a segment, I guess, like two, two and a half minute, whatever it is, thing called good. Mm -hmm. So if you Google Jocko and good, basically what it is is, oh, you didn't get that promotion. Oh, things haven't worked out well. Good. Gives you a chance to improve. And... Kind of along with that that kind of line of thinking, I use that as motivation. Oh, not gonna make it? Good. I'm gonna I don't care how I feel, I don't care what's going on, I'm gonna bust my ass, I'm gonna work on the show in some capacity, mm-hmm. whatever it is. And with that, there's a song, not safe for work, FYI. No. Uh there's a song by Watsky called Moral of the Story. And for literally two, two and a half years. Every single day of my life, I've listened to this song, and especially the second verse of it. And yeah, and it, it, it's kind of basically just saying, you know what, look, I'm just going to work. I don't care wh- how long it takes. I don't care what it takes. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. That's the gist of it. That's the PC uh, gist <laughs> of it. And anyway, so he opened, came out on stage, Watsky did, coming out to that. And it was just... It was awesome to see. Now, I I don't know how old he is. He's probably mid-20s or so. Mm -hmm. And I just, I like his message. It's always positive. Mm -hmm. It's always, you know what? Yeah, it's it's just a a good way of looking at things. Two and a half hours later, an amazing set. Yes. I I would say it's probably the second best concert I've ever been to behind Mumford & Sons at Red Rocks when they recorded their live album. So it was just awesome to be able to see that. And Adam Vita was like, at the end of his set, he's like, hey, I'm going to be out at the merch table at the end of the show if you guys want to come, you know, say hi or whatever. And you had said that you had wanted to. Yeah, as soon as he said that, I looked at, at you and I was like, yeah, I want to, I would like to meet him because I just from his like little five piece set, five, five song, song set, yeah. instant fan. And I wanted to tell him. Which I can appreciate that. So me uh, uh, again, referencing that, you know, six foot two Marine, you grabbed onto my belt loop and we and we just yeah. <laughs> beelined it out of there and made our way up to the merch table. Mm-hmm. And this was kind of cool. It was an all ages concert and there were people buying stuff left and right. But there were a, a number of well, smaller folks. I mean, I'm six two, two fifteen. Yeah, there was like, you know, there's a couple like 15, 14, 15 year old kids that and they they very much did not realize what 
people would want to buy, I guess, because they had when we got up to the merch table, they had five T-shirts left. Right. And, you know, they had some vinyl. They had some CDs, mm-hmm. some cassette tapes, even yeah. which really surprised me. But that anyway, bizarre. so I was helping bring some of these, young, mm-hmm. you know, smaller folk uh, guys and girls up to the front. Yeah. And there was this one little the, the, this was really cool. I realize I'm going off on a tangent, but indulge me. <laughs> This little kid, and I do mean little, like he, I asked him, I said, how old are you, man? And he said, 13. And he was five foot nothing. Yeah. And just tiny. And I was like, come here, man. And so I kind of helped him up to the front because we were up at the front mm-hmm. of the merch table waiting for Adam right. to show up. And he was all like kind of big eyed. And he's like, man, thank you so much. Gave me a fist bump. Said, I'm just waiting for that testosterone to kick <laughs> in. And I told him the story. I was like, look, dude, I said, I was a little bit older than you. I was 18 when I went to the Marine, went to boot camp. I was six foot, right about six foot, 156 pounds. I said, now I'm 6'2", 220. I said, it'll kick in, give it time. Just <laughs> He relax. was like, it'll. whoa, it was yeah. so cute. Yeah, it was, it was, it was cool. It, yeah. it was cool to help them out while we were Oh yeah, it was really stuff. cool. And you were like, you know, let's just go. I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. And it'd been like half an hour since yeah. the show had ended. But the place was filing out. And I was like, nah, we'll wait. I said, Watsky's going to come out here. And I don't get big eyed. I don't get like, oh, you know, over whoever it is. Right. I mean, whether it's celebrities, or whether the it's king sports of stars or, or the king of Jordan, which <laughs> I should tell that story sometime. <laughs> I was just like, oh, that'd be cool. But I imagine that. If Watsky's anything like me, and given the way his his songs are, I imagine he is in this respect, that it's pretty cool. Like, when people tell you how you have impacted their lives, yeah, that shit sticks with you. Like, that impacts you. Mm-hmm. That matters. It does. When, when I was going through my weight loss journey and all that, the amount of people that had written in and, and told me, that, hey, this has motivated that. And I'm not talking board games necessarily. Hey, we helped turn you on to some board games. Awesome. Cool. Or turned you off of some. Also, cool. Mm-hmm. But we're talking like real life stuff. So that stuff, that really matters to mm-hmm. me. And I imagine it would to him. So I was like, you know, Watsky's going to come out here. I said, nah, let's wait. I said, I want to be able to tell him that. Plus, it'd be cool to get a picture with him. Couple minutes go by. Here comes security. Who comes rolling Here he out? Comes. Yep, there's Watsky. And there was a uh, not a bridal shower. What do you call that? A that, uh, bachelorette party. Yeah. And so they were all like, ah, and getting pictures and all that stuff. And then Ran told him, "Hey, yeah, I grabbed him. I was like, no, you're. I, I wasn't going to let him leave. I like had a hold of his arm, and I was like, listen, my husband is a huge fan, and he." really needs to talk to you and he was like okay yeah so uh took uh, amanda took a bunch of pictures and one of which there was it was he and i looking at each Mm -hmm. other and we this is me him telling him that you know hey for the last couple years i've been listening to the moral of the story it's been kind of my my life's theme song for the last couple years you know people doubting whether or not something you know whether or not things would work out whatever and now I'm self-employed thanks to, well, all y'all listening yeah. out there, as well as, you know, the viewers that might listen to this on mm-hmm. YouTube after the fact. And yeah, and he was like, that's really cool, man. Yeah. I appreciate you telling me. I was like, you mind a couple pictures? He's like, nah. <laughs> so uh, also his, his uh, I don't know who it is, but the person who schedules the shows was like, hey, you know what? We need to get you out to Red Rocks. And I was like, hell yeah. I was like, so we'll see you at Red Rocks. And as we said in a recent episode, Red Rocks is arguably the best venue on the planet mm-hmm. to watch a show. So, yeah, I told him, I was like, yeah, we'll see you at Red yeah, Rocks. And he's absolutely. Like, cool. <laughs> and then I tweeted about it, and then he responded to it on Twitter. Yes. He just seemed like cool dude. Yeah. And, and dude is high energy, real intense. Um, and just, yeah, it's it's really helped me get through the last couple of years, trials, tribulations, whatever, days that are really hard. So it was just cool to be able to tell him face to face that, mm-hmm. hey, I really appreciate it's you know, a big deal, and I'm so so thankful you got to tell yeah, him. Yeah, that was pretty cool. And also, B, if you hear this, obviously I tell this in good nature, but I appreciate it, man. Seriously, without that, I don't know that I would have worked as hard as I did. So, mm-hmm. and I know you didn't mean it in a in any kind of I don't know mean or derogatory way. No, it not just, at all. It, it just seemed very unlikely. Which, mm-hmm. granted, it totally did. But it helped give me the motivation to get where we're at. And it's, 
it's just a matter of time now, you know, onward and upward and everything. So I just want to say, hey, B, I appreciate it, man. Good looking out. <laughs> so after a long story long there, I guess, Heavy Con Prep is definitely big time underway. The first set of giveaways, uh, there, there, we got a total of, I want to say it was like 19 games in one group of packages, which is awesome for giveaways. Yes. So super excited about that. So thanks to all the publishers that have said they will send games and support and publishers and sponsors for the show. So whether that's, you know, Game Surplus or Meeple Realty Mm -hmm. or Board Game Tables or just friends in the industry or just publishers and accessory folks in general, we really appreciate all that. And I think... Equally, all the attendees will appreciate Absolutely. that. So looking forward to that. And I guess I should have prefaced the fact that I am getting sick. So today was today was supposed to be the live stream of the Hunters. But that got postponed because, I well, honestly, I just needed some rest. And after Gen Con and the six-week ordeal that that was fighting off that sickness, I'm like, you know what? Delay it for a day. Not the yeah. end of the world. So the Hunters will be out tomorrow for the, uh, for the live stream mm-hmm. of that. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Two last things, then we'll move on. If y'all didn't listen to the weekly look ahead last week, you didn't hear about what our plans are for caffeine and caffeine being the other platform that we stream on other than YouTube. Caffeine.tv forward slash heavy cardboard is where you can go and subscribe or follow, I think is what it is. Mm -hmm. You get notified anytime we go live over there. We're going to use that as kind of a sandbox. So off the wall, non-traditional, and by traditional, I mean all the stuff that you guys are used to us streaming over on YouTube, we're not going to be doing that on Caffeine. We realized that we had a meeting with with some folks there, and they, they've they heard that everybody's suggestions, or call them complaints or whatever, and they've heard what we need, and all these things are planned, but as it is right now, it's not happening overnight. Things don't happen that fast. So in the meantime, we're trying to make use of the platform for what it is. And as an example, yesterday, I went ahead and live streamed Through the Ages on the app, Mm -hmm. you know, the the app implementation. And that was really cool. We had about, I don't know, 30, 40 people interacting with us and giving, and and by us, I mean, it was me by myself. And it was kind of a collaborative thing to where because the chat is in real time, Hey, what should we do here? And it was cool. It became a mix between a interactive play with me as well as like a strategy discussion right. stream. It's really and cool. it was it ended up really cool. So we're gonna nice. we're gonna be using caffeine as a platform to try other things. Like, you know, we call it game day at heavy cardboard when we stream over on YouTube and teach the games and all this, but we're gonna probably do some less formal ones mm-hmm. and maybe some gonzo streams like no teach just play and not really scheduled just mm-hmm. hey we're we're live over on caffeine for a few hours we're playing with this game whatever right. it is so stuff that we would normally not be doing on camera we may do on camera mm-hmm. and if we do it'd be over on caffeine yeah. then when we do the formal teaching and playthroughs and all that of that game we'll do that over on youtube mm-hmm. that type thing so th- that app implementations and just other things that we want to try out. That's what we're going to use that platform for. And we found that it worked really well last night with the uh, with the Through the Ages app. And so we're gonna we're gonna try out new stuff and and see what y'all think about it. Yeah. So that's what's going on over there. Awesome. The last thing I wanted to bring up is kind of a uh, well funny anecdote, I guess, or at least I found it funny. When I was at PAX East, Jess had gotten me a thing of Reese's peanut butter cups, which is by far my all time favorite candy bar. Now we can argue whether or not it's a candy bar per se. Right. I get that because they are Reese's peanut butter cups. They are mm-hmm. not a Reese's peanut butter bar. Right. I as, as Jess says, they are candy cups. It's a candy bar. Um, you know what? I, I'm, I'm curious to hear the debate on this real I quick. I honestly kind of agree with Jess. You, you guys have the right to be wrong. So, but <laughs> I'm curious to hear I'm curious to hear what the herd thinks. Does a candy bar have to be a bar? Like, can it be uh, like Skittles? I mean, 
That's not it, a candy it, bar. Yeah, I get that. But if you were to go to like 7-Eleven or, or whatever and it's you say, in, hey, grab me a candy bar. What do you want? And you said Skittles. I wouldn't be like, no, that's not a candy see, bar. I'm not going to get that. I would. That's not a, that's a candy. Ugh. If you if you say grab candy me a candy. Candy are like Jolly Ranchers, individual candies. Whatever. You're wrong. Well, okay. I'm curious what the herd says. Anyway, <laughs> Jess got me some Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. And it was one of those with the four piece, uh, you know, the four pack. Of it? It's enormous. Well, no, 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 not the, not the, 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 just the regular four pack. You know, the normal one comes with two yeah. Reese's peanut butter cups, right? Like the king the, size. Right there, you go. That's what it was. It was king size, so it had four Reese's peanut butter cups, and I wasn't eating them. And she asked me, and she's like, "Why, why aren't you eating them?" I'm like, "You can't open it and not eat them all. <laughs> you don't partially eat Reese's peanut butter cups. Like, who does that now?" There, there's enough there to share, so uh-huh. maybe I have two and I, I split two with other folks, right. whatever. But I was like, ha, you don't partially eat those. So eventually opened them, ate them all, or shared, whatever, it doesn't matter. Fast forward a couple days, <laughs> and I can't remember what day, whether it was Saturday or Sunday, she surprised me with this enormous thing of Reese's Peanut it's Butter like Cups. It's like for a giant. It really is. It's, imagine... It's like a foot long. Well, it, it's a pound. They're, yeah. they're half pound Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> and there's two of them in there. And she was like, oh, I guess you can't eat them just, you know, and leave them half eaten. And I was like, ain't that up. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? This will make for a fun stream. So one of the live streams here at, before HeavyCon, not sure which. Okay, challenge accepted. It should be a caffeine stream, and all it is is you eating the giant Reese's peanut butter cup. That that also is an option, but the fact is, is all right, challenge accepted, because I said you can't partially eat <laughs> Reese's peanut butter cups. A pound, uh, dude, I am going to be miserable. Yep. I will win. <laughs> I will win, though. All right? priorities and yeah nah uh 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 I will win this so we will we will let y'all know when that's going to be but that's so a thing that's happening absolutely Reese's peanut butter cups the best candy bar of all time it's a candy cup big thank you to our sponsor boardgametables.com if you're in the market for a customized one-of-a-kind board game table. Go check them out, boardgametables.com. It's been a little bit since we talked about games that we've acquired, so there's quite a few. There have been a a number that have crossed the threshold here at HCHQ. Total of 15, actually. Eight of which are published, and surprisingly, seven prototypes. Yipes! And I gotta say, all these prototypes are in... Prototypes have come a long way, man. Yeah. Well, I feel like that there's the prototype, like we played at Lyriacon, which, you know, is like pieces of paper with stuff scribbled on it. Right. And then, oh, here, let me uh, cross that out and then write down what I think it should be. That's what I think of as a prototype, but that's that's not. That's like pre- Pre prototype, I guess. No, oh, they're just early iterations yeah, of prototypes. Yeah, very and, early. And the ones that we're getting are late stage. Yeah, this is like oh, just ahead of a Kickstarter, mm-hmm. but these look really nice. And I mean, if you look at our live stream of stuff like the brass games, right, as well as Founders of Gloomhaven, Moa. stuff like that, right, really, really nice prototype. So let's go ahead and talk about the uh, the published games first. So Hannibal and Hamilcar. We got that edition. Man, that looks good. Mm -hmm. Cannot wait to play that. Realistically, it's going to have to wait just because of how the schedule is going and all the travel that's coming up. But this summer, definitely looking forward to both playing it, reviewing it, and live streaming it. So that'll be uh, one to look forward to. We reacquired Hoshbell Connect and the Ruhr Valley expansion. Because honestly, the Ruhr Valley expansion, I think, fixes the biggest gripe that I had with the game, which was it just kind of got Mm samey after a mm -hmm. while. And so I'm anxious to try it with the expansion now. And when Clay came out here for the live stream, he brought a copy of the Climbers because he asked me, hey, do you have it? I was like, no, I have the original. He's like, I'll bring you one. I was like, cool, good deal. Also brought the updated components for Arkwright. Woo! Yeah, those look good. I don't know that they're necessary. (laughs) 
but they're cool. So it's one of those. I mean, it's like anytime you pimp a game yeah. with whatever, right? Like what we've done with Dominant Species. Right. Is it necessary? No. no. But it looks cool. So, all right. Then he got some, he brought a handful of sets of green workers that were painted purple that are now painted green for Lignum. <laughs> It's a running joke because they originally were supposed to be purple or green, but they were actually purple in the game. So he brought us some replacements, plus I think some that we can give away on the show. Nice. So we'll be doing that later on in a future episode. Also got a copy of Winter Forge, which I feel bad about this. I actually was given this at Gamma from Passport, but uh, Scott over, but. Kleiker actually brought it home for me because I was limited on how much a space. And honestly, I had container with me and that was nine pounds. <laughs> yeah. I, I only had so much room. And he finally just now got it back to me. So thank you. Speaking of which, there's another one that we picked up at Gamma. Uh, Pot de Vin. It's a little card game. It looks pretty cool. Uh, the artwork looks really nice. So anxious to break that one out. And then we got the published version of Petricor and the expansion. So cool. Whoop, whoop. And now for the prototypes. Medieval Railroad Rivals, which is a super light game, but it's kind of Carcassonne meets Age of Steam. Like this could be an entry oh, point nice. for folks for Age of Steam that, you know, whether it's with younger folks or people that aren't necessarily ready for Age of Steam. Mm -hmm. But yeah, kind of a real simple but kind of cool tile lane uh, uh, pick up and deliver game. Looking forward to, to busting that out. Tales of the Northlands, a.k.a. the Sagas and Nag and the Nog. That's going to be a live stream coming up in a couple weeks, so looking forward to getting that. New Corp Order, which is kind of a, a follow-up to Peak Oil from the folks okay. over at Two Tomatoes. Then There Grew a Kingdom. And I'll be honest, I don't know much about this one. Uh, it, it came from Latvia, which is really, that's just cool. <laughs> so looking forward to digging into that. Blight Chronicles, Agent Decker. We're going to be doing a live stream of that for our friends over at uh, Board and Dice. The Kickstarter just dropped on that. And they asked if we could while we were at Gamma. And I said yes. Which, thematic solo game. I did say we're trying to do more solo games. So mm -hmm. there's that. And then a really big kind of Civ building game that was pretty. It, it's Civ building mythological meets historic meets dudes on a map type stuff kind of called Hellenica coming from Mr. B games. This thing was pretty cool. And that's been sitting on our, one of the tables down in the basement for the better part of a month. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that looks like kind of the, the best way that I could describe it in my so far one play of the game is Mari Nostrum plus. Yeah. And so, yeah, that turned out, uh, I'm, Pretty cool. Looking forward to, to busting that out some more as nice. well. So, yeah, a lot of stuff's coming through A whole through bunch, here, yeah. Huh? All right, so now normally we would talk about, hey, what have we been playing? But if we do that and we give our thoughts on some of these, I think that will kind of ruin some of the anticipation for the announcement of the 2017 Golden Elephant Award finalists. For those of y'all that may not know, the Golden Elephant Award is an annual award handed out to the most outstanding board game of the uh -huh. year from the heavy gamer's perspective as voted upon by Heavy Cardboard. That's us. That's us. Yep, that's us. So... There's a number of criteria that we use, and I figure might as well kind of preface this before we actually go into the finalists for this year. So depth of analysis and planning. So basically, you know, is there depth to the game, right? right? Depth of the gameplay, the game length. It doesn't necessarily have to be long, but it has to have meaningful decision points. Yes, okay? throughout the game. Right. Low luck, that kind of goes without saying, given yeah. kind of the premise of the show. Mm-hmm. And then the opacity of decisions and in interactions. So kind of what degree do the critical decisions within the game have an impact upon other players? Which that's just how easily is it able? are you able to impact other players as well as a decision you make now might not be apparent the outcome of that right. decision or the, the impact of that decision until hours later or Correct. even many decisions later. 
Another thing that we take into consideration is the innovation and uniqueness of the mechanics and the theme. So what makes the game stand apart from its contemporaries? And ultimately, was it enjoyable, right? Yeah. And use the word enjoyable instead of fun because fun is, well, I, I guess you can make the same case that enjoyment mm-hmm. is very subjective. Subjective, yeah. But yeah, we try and avoid the use fun, uh, uh, use the word fun, but I think enjoyment fits here yes, better. So I that's do too. kind of the the nebulous, broad. So that's pretty much the framework that we use to come up with the finalists. Yeah, and how we decide the winner out of the finalists. Right. So to recap, and I'm not going to go through all the finalists here, but 2013 Golden Elephant Award winner, Madeira. In 2014? Arkwright. 2015 was Food Chain Magnate. And last year was 1822, the Railways of Great Britain. So here we are. At the end of April, which the announcements are usually made in March or April, depending on how long it's taken us to get through some of the games, because we, or most of the games, because we try to play as many as possible. Mm -hmm. Usually these come out around Essen time, so having it by the end of the year just isn't practical. I don't care who you are. So that's why we don't do our game of the year, and we announce it at Heavycom, which is the last week in May. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's taken us a little bit longer to go through some of the games that we thought might could possibly be finalists. That said, so here we are at the game table Mm -hmm. in the studio. In between us, there are scraps of paper that have all of the agreed upon 2017 Golden Elephant Award finalists. So we don't know the order in which we're going to announce (laughs) these. This is not alphabetical. It's nothing. It's whatever we grab. Yeah. In this way, it doesn't. It doesn't ruin any of the surprise and, and, you know, oh, wait, they've already gone to F, so it can't be that game. <laughs> right. That type stuff. So we thought we'd have a little fun with it. Yeah. Now, we could tell you how many there are, which I guess we could. Or now, well, yeah, let's let's tell them how many this year. So the in 2013, let's go through this real quick. In 2013, there, there were, were a total of nine. Right? Wow. That's a lot. In 14, there were seven. 15, there were seven. And in 16, there were six. Mm -hmm. In 17, there are six. There are six. So, would you like to have the honor for the first one? Absolutely. So, let's pick one. Yes. Gaia Project. Wow. All right. All right. Gaia Project was designed by Jens Drogemuller and Helge Ostertag. Artwork by Dennis Lohausen. And in America, it was published by Z-Man. A.K.A. Asmode. Correct. And we have covered the game, or at least we will cover the game this weekend. We'll have a full teach and playthrough on YouTube. Right. Improving on the base of Terra Mystica, Gaia Project features 14 different factions that live on seven different planets. In order to live on another planet, it must be terraformed into their original home environment. Each faction can grow their skill set in six different areas of advancement, gaining rewards and other benefits along the way. So only a couple plays of Gaia Project so far, but it's impressed the hell out of me. Yes. I will say that. Uh, even though uh, Terra Mystica, we were kind of eh on overall, I feel like, and I think I read this somewhere, that Gaia Project is Terra Mystica with five more years of development. Seriously. In it. Which yes. is basically a refinement of it, or Ga- or Terra Mystica in space. It it definitely feels a lot like Terra Mystica. It, it just feels like it feels like a better Terra Mystica. It really does. So yeah, props to uh, designers and publisher, mm-hmm. and good luck in the finalists. Mm-hmm. Next up, we have John Company, designed by Cole Worley, artwork by Cole Worley, published by Sierra Madre Games. We haven't covered it yet. I get that. But you know what? Cole's going to do the teaching, and we're going to live stream it the day before HeavyCon begins. So he's going to be here on the Tuesday before. So barring any unforeseen circumstance, Mm -hmm. this will be covered, at least in that respect, on Heavy Cardboard before the award is given out. So the British East India Company story is told from the perspective of the dynasties that are trying to guide their scions through the company, vying for position, power, and prestige. Your goal is to secure your family's place in society back in London. 
You control the company, make decisions regarding budgets, conflicting interests, and exchanging favors. Yeah, that doesn't really say a whole lot about the game. It's an experience for sure to where, much like a game that I've played kind of recently in Greed, Inc., that your job is kind of to be out of the company and retired and the retirement that you are able to acquire is worth a certain number of victory points and those victory points are what dictate the end of the game. Heavy negotiation, so very group dependent, Mm -hmm. but it's unlike any other game that I have played and leave it to Cole. Yeah, This is yet another finalist. He had an infamous traffic last year and yeah, it just, just, and PAX Premier the year before. Yeah. So I guess it, it start. dare I say, we're starting to trend into fanboy Uh-oh. Uh, territory. But you know what? He designs really cool games. Yeah. So yeah, John Company, congratulations, Cole. Next up, we have Keeper. Designed by Richard Breeze, artwork by Vicki Dalton, published by R&D Games. And we have covered it in episode 104, as well as a full teach and playthrough on YouTube. Keeper is another worker placement game set within the key series of games, which birthed the worker placement genre. In Keeper, each player works toward gain- gaining the most points by building up their village, showing off in fairs, and doing their best to thwart their opponents. Keeper is like a nice version of Keyflower. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it came out of nowhere in a yes. sense. That leading, and I've told this story a number of times, that leading up to to Essen, I really, it really wasn't on my radar that much. Like, yeah, I'll check it out, right. whatever. But eh, I expected more Key to the City London mm-hmm. and less Key Flower. And then we played it and that all changed. And Jim over on Punching Cardboard said, you know what? I'd read through the rules and now nah, there's a lot more here than, than you would think. Yeah, yeah. So we played it and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed yes. that game. Yes. A whole lot. The county boards to where, you know, the folding and all. Yeah. It is a bit gimmicky in a sense, but it works really well to add a little bit of player driven randomness into the game. And even though there's the randomness of the bag draws, et cetera, et cetera, overall, really enjoyed this game. And I think it's I think it's a, a, a good finalist here. I think it fits wholeheartedly. Oh, absolutely. If you want to hear more about what we thought about it, go to episode 104, but it was, it's just the, the, the gimmickiness of the boards. It's gimmicky, but it's awesome. And it's one of my favorite parts of the game. And it just plays, it plays so well with no matter really, no matter the player count, it just plays really well. Very smoothly. It does. Yes. Agreed. Yes. Still not thrilled about the rule book, but that's neither here nor there. (laughs) So congrats, Richard Breeze, on the finalist nomination. Number four of six, we have Liz Boa, designed by Vital Lacerda, artwork by Ian O'Toole, published by Eagle Griffin Games. We've done full teach and playthrough over on YouTube, and we also reviewed it in episode 80. After the 9.0 magnitude earthquake, tsunami, and fires of 1755, that was a stretch of really bad days. It's a few bad days, yeah. The city of Lisbon, Portugal, had to be rebuilt. The city was rebuilt meticulously, and only certain businesses were permitted on each street. Use your influence to help rebuild the city, develop commerce, and reopen all buildings. I think this is the least surprising game of the finalists. Pretty much unanimously, everybody kind of knew that we were. this was going to be. From the time we played it originally, the, everything, every mechanism within the game is thematically fitting. Mm-hmm. The amount of history that goes into the game, plus a lot are just miserably hard decisions that yes. you have throughout the entire game. And I say that as the utmost compliment. That's kind of what we dig yeah. in games. Yeah. So, yeah, really, really happy for this game. So, congrats to VTOL. And, well, I guess, you know, our buddy Ian over, uh, for the artwork. Really well done, fellas. Absolutely. Next up, we have 18CZ, designed by Leonard or Lonnie Orgler. Artwork also by Lonnie. It is also published by Lonnie, and uh, his company is called Fox in the Box. And Tony and you did a full teach and two-player playthrough on YouTube. We did. 
18CZ is set of the Czech Republic. It uses three different corporation sizes, five small companies, five medium companies, and five large companies. Each company uses different trains, and the main goal is to absorb the smaller companies into the bigger ones. This game offers what, in our opinion, is the best two-player experience for any 18XX game in the genre. Now, granted, 18XX games are not... aren't really designed as two-player games. Right, but I feel like that's what makes us stand apart. I, I do as well. Now, there are other 18XX mm-hmm. games that can be played too, and some better than others, but absolutely special and just it felt like a full, complete 18xx game experience at two players, which I can't necessarily say the same for mm-hmm. every other that I've experienced yeah, that we have experienced. Very, and, very hard to do. Yeah. So overall, really, really excited about this game. I think it belongs on this list, mm-hmm. if for no other reason, for the two player. I realize that's what I'm highlighting here, but overall. Yeah, a really good entry and a good evolution of the 18xx system. So, well done, Lonnie. Yes. Last but not least, we have Time of Crisis. Designed by Ray Farrell and Brad Johnson. Artwork by Roger McGowan. Published by GMT Games. We did a full teach and playthrough over on YouTube of it. Set in the crisis time of the 3rd century, each player attempts to raise their Roman dynasty to the highest power in the land. Build armies, build political capital, and take over other provinces. Deck building meets war game. I realize that some people are going to put the war game aspect of this in quotes because there's not dudes on a map. There right. are some chits, but not in your typical war game fashion. No, not, yeah. But I feel like this is a excellent merging of mechanics, and I think that this is going to end up being a an evergreen title, potentially, for... GMT in a sense that this could be an excellent entry level point to bring Euro players over to the war game side of things. Absolutely. It's similar to the coin series in that it's, you know, you have what what Euro players are used to. There's bits and there's cards and there's things that you can it's it's familiar. It's not a giant stack of these little tiny chits that you don't really know what it is. You have cards and you have things that you, that are familiar to you that you can as kind well of as the easily mechanisms. go into right yeah and the and the mechanisms are going to feel very familiar right right as well and I just really really adore this game i think it's been uh when we went to wbc last year it was everywhere mm-hmm. in every other convention i've gone to i've seen it played multiple times all over whether it's a war game it's centric uh, uh, convention or otherwise and you know all of our plays here at HCHQ have been well wonderful they've been really really good yeah really really pleased for it and congratulations to Ray Brad and GMT so that's it those are the six finalists so we have well you don't need me to recap it you just heard that right. right but you know what let's do it anyways we have time <laughs> of crisis 18 CZ keeper John Company, Lisboa, and Gaia Project. Now, I realize that there's going to be a whole lot of other games that people are like, oh, what about this? What about that? What about this? I get that. I mean, there there were a number of games that we looked into that mm-hmm. we thought could have made it. And to mention some of them, right? So there's Sidereal Confluence. There's Pixie Queen. There's Agra. Then there's a couple of other games, and they're 18 Ireland. Clans of Caledonia. Ooh, good call, right. 4X. A few people mentioned Kalimala, but I'm not... I think that was a little little too light. light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Then there's Altaplano, mm -hmm. some folks had thought about, and there's just... Yeah, Pendragon is... And I'll be honest, Pendragon missed out in a sense that we just... We ran out of time, we didn't get to it. So, but everything else that we mentioned on this list has been played at least once by, by, by us. And there are a couple others that we haven't talked about yet that there were a lot of people that were asking about it. And those are the two that we've been playing recently yeah. in the last couple of weeks. First off, we'll talk about Noosh Fjord, which Uwe Rosenberg's latest mm-hmm. that came out last year. 
And what were your thoughts on it? Well, I posted a picture of it on Instagram, and the caption that I used was that it was Uva's best game in a while. And, I mean, that's not high praise, really, but it it is. I, I would rather play that game over Feast for Odin or Fields of Arla. Which, all, both of those games, well-designed games. Yeah. They're, they're, they're very good games, but just not our cup of tea because they, they tend to be a lot more wide open than what it is that we prefer. Correct. And when we played News Fjord, it was fine. Yeah. It was Uva's best in a while. Now, I will say that the prototype that we played in at Lyriacon is better than News Fjord, in my opinion. It's called Recolt. I believe it'll be out next year. No, I think it's later on this year. I think I it's. Hope so. I think uh, here in the states, it's going to be coming out from Renegade Games yeah. and uh, uh, overseas as Frosted, Frosted Games. Yeah, right. I hope so. I hope it's soon because it's, in my opinion, it's better than New Fjord. Absolutely. That said, uh, it was fine. There, it, it, it was an enjoyable game, mm-hmm. but I just, I, I just wasn't. Yeah, I didn't think it was it was Golden Elephant Award material. Honestly, no. I, I I'm okay with saying that it was an enjoyable game. It was fine, but yeah, that's that's it. Nothing more, nothing less. Then there's the quote unquote elephant in the room, yeah. Gloomhaven. So we played this. Uh, we played it a couple of times now, and I think it is excellent at what it tries to do. Yes, both it, you and I enjoy playing. RPGs on as video games. Yes, as video games is the best way to put it, like Diablo. And for me, I really enjoy stuff like Skyrim mm-hmm. or Fallout, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. RPG type games, which Gloomhaven is exactly like that, but as a board game mm-hmm. and what it does differently. I mean, it's the number one game on BGG at this time, right? And I can totally understand why. Yes. The fact that it takes a dungeon crawl and makes it, it's co-op, but not. Mm -hmm. There's no die rolling. There's actually surprisingly little amount of luck in the game. Mm -hmm. And we both enjoyed the game. Yes. But but it's just not, no, it it, it just, it it just didn't grab us a whole lot. No. And if, if I want to play a dungeon crawler, I'm not going to want to play it where I have to try to figure out where each of the pieces are moving. That's not my thing. I, I want to play a video game. I don't want to play a board game. I, I played as a uh, Vermling Mind Thief. I was the Orchid Spell Weaver. And Matt was the uh, Enox Brute in our in our uh, short campaign so far. Correct. I have to say, though, that the Orchid Spell Weaver is beautiful. And all of the backstories are awesome. It was a very. It's very well done. It's just not our cup of tea. And, and the the mechanisms in the game are actually really well done. To where you you have a deck of cards and you're not randomly drawing your cards. You are playing them. Mm-hmm. You're playing two cards each turn, and you have a lot of really hard decisions in this mm-hmm. game. As far as you can only use the upper part of one card, the bottom part of another card, right. et cetera, et cetera. You're gonna lose and, a card, and you have to figure out which one. And... Right. And so there there are a lot of really good meaningful decisions and i understand why it's as popular as it is Mm -hmm. it's just not not our cup of tea and that's okay yeah so i think it's a remarkable design Mm -hmm. but just not for for us then yep and i would agree with that so there you have it the six finalists for the 2017 golden elephant award we're very curious to hear what what should have what could have or what you would have put on okay. your list. Yes, please you, let us know. If you're going to limit it, limit it to six or seven mm-hmm. finalists. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious what they would have been using the same criteria that yeah. we do. Yes. All right? So hit us up either on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Heavy Cardboard everywhere. Yeah. Or they can email us. Contact at heavycardboard.com. Really looking forward to hearing what you guys think. And there's going to be four awards this year handed out by Heavy Cardboard third person really handed out by us for this year there is only one physical award that physical award is going to go to one of those six finalists but there's also going to be the people's choice Mm -hmm. which is going to be voted on by the nearly 700 patrons as well as the attendees of heavy con so the people's choice award will be well exactly what that says yes so they're out of those six finalists there will be that 
We're also going to introduce two other categories this year that don't qualify for the Golden Elephant Award, but we feel like, at least in some sort of recognition, it's important to give recognition to things that just we we exclude right. from wouldn't ha- would never be able to even be nominated or right. anything and that is thinky filler as defined by us as a game in which you would never go to a game day to play solely as the meat of your game day mm-hmm. so thinky filler best thinky filler of 2017 and also best reprint because we don't do reprints that is correct so yeah this should be a lot of fun so all of those all four of those will be announced at heavycon mm-hmm. and in the following uh, following episode the week later. Yes. All right, here on the podcast. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. I'm really, really curious to hear you guys agree, disagree, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of disagreement and discussion Absolutely. on this. So it should be a lot of fun. Lots to, of debate. Let's yeah. do it. All right, we'll see you all on the Guild. We'll see you all in Slack. We'll see you on social media. See Take care, around. everybody. Bye, everybody.